everyone, I'm Annie Dickerson, and on behalf of the entire Good Egg Investments team, I wanted to welcome you to this episode of The Life and Money Show, the show where we talk about everything from investing to financial freedom to parenting, traveling, creating a life by design, and everything in between. I'm here with my amazing co-host, Susan Elliott, and today we have such a fun conversation for you. Today we're talking about can money buy happiness? It is something we have all thought, I am sure. Not not one listener can say that they haven't thought, if I just had X amount of money, I might feel a certain way, maybe happier, maybe easier, maybe better, maybe something along those lines. So it's nice to dive into this. And this is the impetus of today's conversation is this new study that came out um, just towards the end of last year that has really put different dollar signs on what different generations think about the amount of money they need in order to be happy, whether that's an annual salary or a net worth. So we're going to dive into those numbers and like picking them apart a little bit and then thinking from our own experience, has money given us happiness? <laughs> and if not, or if so, like how are we optimizing that process along the way so that really it comes down to like decoupling the idea of money and happiness for us, I think. I mean, we don't want to rely on anything to give us happiness, I think, externally in in, in that. So uh, so we're going to dive into all of that today. And uh, I'm really excited to have this conversation with you, Annie, because I know that we all think critically about this as we, you know, it's not just about the numbers behind our investing, behind our budgets and saving. It is so much about how we feel about our lives along the way, how we're living our lives along the way, because ultimately we're on this path of life and money to be able to live our dream life, to do what we want to do with our time to have flexibility and freedom and ease in our daily life. Um, so we're going to dive into all of that. And we are also putting a lot of this content up on our YouTube channel. We're really trying to dive into the entire process of money and life out there and creating videos for you along the way. And you can find more of that content by just searching Good Egg Investments on YouTube, just like you would in any search engine, and you'll find some of those great videos. All right. So with that, um, I guess let's start first before we dive into our personal experience, because there's so much here to talk about. But let's start with that impetus you talked about this um, this new study. So last year, Empower, a financial services company, released the results of a survey conducted by the Harris Poll in August of 2023 that asked over 2000 Americans ages 18 and over about what they thought the key to financial happiness really was. Turns out 59% of respondents said that happiness could be bought. And respondents on average said it would take having 1.2 million in the bank to be truly happy financially. And we're going to get into, you know, the differences per um, the generations. But just from that, you know, Susan, what are your thoughts? I mean, most people, 60% of people said happiness could be bought. What do you think? Do you agree? I don't agree. I don't agree at all. And I, I think that we're spreading out the word happiness too broadly in that. So what what do you mean? What are you buying? What what would the money do to make your life better or more happier? And I would I would say, like, if we do drill drill down into that, and these are just theories, of course, I read through a good bit of this study and the other findings that they had. But Happiness is just so broad. I think that people in responding to this, at least I would in responding to this type of poll, think about like, what would make my life just like easy and worry free? Like, how could I, maybe respondents were also thinking about what types of things make me happy that I need to buy. And if I had X amount of money, I could then buy those things again with no worry or no stress. Um, and and it's it's kind of shocking the differences here. Now, this is also measured against um, a similar poll that was done in 2010, a similar study, which has been more, more or less the benchmark from up until now about like, what is the threshold at which money will make us happy? And then beyond that, it's sort of like um, marginal returns of, you know, every dollar beyond this amount is not going to give you the same amount of happiness as every dollar up until that. In this 
point was $75,000 of annual income. So in 2010, the average respondent had said, well, at, at $75,000, or they found that every dollar after that, that an annual earnings that someone would make was giving them less proportional happiness up until that point. Um, but these numbers in this study have blown that out pretty, pretty wildly. What are, What is your thought about buying happiness and how there's more people these days that think that it can be bought yeah. than not. I mean, 60% I mean, isn't a huge majority, but. Right, right. Um, it's, you know, it's certainly not everybody, but, you know, I've had a long road with, uh, happiness has always been something on my mind because as a kid, my mom would always ask me, are you happy? Are you happy? And so I always had to assess, wait, am I happy? And um, almost every birthday that I can remember when I was a kid, the candles would be lit on the cake and it'd be time for me to make my wish. And I would never wish for like a bike or, you know, a, a Nintendo or whatever it was. I would always just wish to be happy. And I never really mm -hmm. had an idea what that meant or how much money that meant. I just wanted to be happy. Um, mm -hmm. And it wasn't until um, much later into adulthood that I started to uh, discern this distinction between happiness, joy, and fulfillment. And I think as a kid, I was thinking happiness was all of those things. And um, in reality, I discovered, and I'll get into this in a bit, through my own experience that happiness is more surface level, as you mentioned, um, and can be more fleeting. And so while I do partially agree that money can buy happiness to a certain extent, like it can buy the external things, it can buy the luxury goods and the, you know, give you more capacity to donate and things like that. Some of those things might only make you happy for a period of time. But then after that, once you get used to that new normal of always flying first class or always staying in the nice suite or whatever it is, that becomes your new normal. And so turns out, even at that level, all the same problems will come back in. So it's not like you're going to perpetually be happy if you have those material things. That's been my experience anyway. Yeah. So <laughs> it's interesting to think about like, like it makes me think about, do I have a number that all my problems would go away if I just earned X amount of money and, and wondering like, is there actual value in that too? I mean, I'm, I'm a high achieving person. I have goals in different realms of my life. I have, you know, running goals, athletic goals, as most of our listeners have probably heard me talk about. And I do have financial goals. I have a FI number, a financial independence number. I know that like, I need to keep growing my investments so that I can retire one day um, and have this kind of freedom. So like, what is the balance, do you think, Annie, in having sort of this a, a goal that is a dollar sign, that is a number sign, while also like not neglecting, not putting off my happiness until I reach that goal? Yeah. Well, you know, it makes me think about the people who took this survey and the way that they took the survey, because most people, as we've discovered, haven't done the work to actually figure out their financial independence or financial freedom number. They're just kind of shooting a dart out there, especially if mm -hmm. they're being asked, what, what number do you want? And so they're thinking, oh, I'll just pick a number randomly because they don't know. They haven't done that work to figure out, okay, how much do I actually spend on average per month? How much would I need to be able to cover my expenses? Um, so I think it's very valuable to have that insight and it's going to change as we see through these generations It's going to change as you get to different phases of your life, but having that transparency, having that clarity as to how much do I currently spend and how much in passive income would I need to be able to cover that so that I, that I don't have to work. I think that's a very valuable target to have. Um, so that you don't, because most people will overshoot that number. They'll just kind of fudge it and be like, yeah, I think I'll probably spend, you know, 10,000. Let's just round it up to 20,000. And so that means, you know, in a year I would need this much and probably would want a little bit more so I could save. And so they're just shooting in the dark. They're just picking a number. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. in reality, you know, even if 
And uh, I've done exercises on this where, you know, even if you write down everything you could possibly dream of that you would ever want in your life, like a yacht, private jet, world-class travel, all of that stuff, you write it all down. And then you actually take the time to research how much that costs. Almost all the time, people think it costs way more than it actually does. And so it's not it's even the not private a, jet. I oh, mean, yeah. that's billions, I mean, right? <laughs> right. Well, here's the thing is when you do the research on the private jet, you realize how much work it is to, to maintain it, especially if you mm-hmm. really think about how often would I use that private jet? Well, probably only like, you know, a few times a year. Well, I don't want private jet the whole year. Well, you know what? I'm going to rent a private jet. Oh, that's actually a lot cheaper. So it's like these things that people, they just, they have these high goals that they've never really done the work to, to really think through. And I think that's what mm-hmm. leads to some of these inflated numbers. Mm-hmm.